lot of it is over spring break. But the but for sure the first seven pages completed will be due on May 13th. So I'm giving it to you now to get started on it, and then after about page seven, I pick and choose what you have to do. So and these are the basic facts from notes, and then when I do review sessions, it's a great way to review. I go through stuff to remind you of things. It really is beneficial. Everybody who went to the review sessions last year, um, it was noticeable how much better they did and felt, felt they did on the test. Next, you're not doing a full DBQ. What you're doing is you're doing just some of the doc as a document practice for the DBQ on the new deal. So here's your prompt. I want to get into two sheets because it's the same paper. So write your thesis right above it. You're, you're very talented young people, right? Most of you are pretty young, right? What's the definition of young? Younger than me. That's the definition of young, right? Everybody remember that. If you're younger than me, then you're young. That means almost everybody in this school is young. Moving on. So you have documents to read. OK, did you get this stuff? So you have to read these documents, and this is phrases, so it's not sentences, or it does not have to be a pin, but answer those questions below. So put in context for each document. So stuff you're going to know about the new deal that we do in class, you're going to have to read on your own, you have to know. Next, so that is due on Monday. This is also due on Monday. Page 516 to 518 in the uh, review book, eight multiple choice questions. You must do those multiple choice questions. There's a stimulus. That's how the AP does it to give you a stimulus that will get you in the frame of mind of the era that the, that the uh, questions are in. The questions are not directly from, it's either a document or a cartoon or whatever it might be, but it's more like it's going to be related to it and about that era. Now, the big reason we have to do this, we have to start getting used to the style they write, AP, or write questions for the AP exam. And that's my feeling towards standardized tests. So you just have to get used to it. So when you're done on Teams for the thing I have for spring break assignment, I have the key. So just check how you do it. And I'll just give you credit, just a few points for it, but I want you to do it and start practicing it, and I'll reward you for doing it. Lastly, on Tuesday or Wednesday of that week after, we're going to do the test on the new deal. Some of these things we'll know in class. Some of these things you have to get from chapter 25 of the textbook. I originally was going to give you the full list, but I narrowed it down to what we're going to have on the test. Sound good? This is what you have to know. I'll answer questions on Monday. I'll go through a few more things, and then we'll do the test. The asterisks, probably going to be short IDs or chance questions. And there is a chance for extra math. Yes? It's going to be um, a few multiple choice, a few matching, and then short IDs. So it'll be close to a Questions. Extra credit. So, there are two great documentaries on the Great Depression we don't have time to watch, and so I'm setting up for you to do extra credit on it. It's on Teams, the links are there, and there are two worksheets, one worksheet for each one. If you decide you want to do it, you on your way out can pick them up right here. If you decide you don't want to do it, and there are two. I really like those, I think they're fantastic. I really hope you like them. I think they're great. But, you will get more credit if you do both. Right. There, I really enjoy, it. and I just, I just checked again to make sure the links work, and they worked for two people in my study hall. So hopefully they'll work for everybody. You know how that is, but that's a chance for extra credit. Sound good? Any questions? Yes. So when you say the first, second page, you said all the. That will you have to do those. Back. Yeah, front and back. Yeah. Yeah, front and back, page through page stuff. But that will be, I want not, I'm not going to collect this till May 13th, but I'm giving it to you now. Yeah. Okay, and then we have two sections, in the, or two sections each in one book. So we have chapter 25 from the textbook, and uh, that one. Yeah, from the review book. And those, that's multiple choice questions. And so it's from the New Deal stuff, you know, from the New Deal stuff. Okay, so we should do like chapter 25 first, and then answer those Yeah. You better go back and review. Yeah. yeah. You better know the material a little bit. Any other questions?
All right, so. All right, so let's go ahead and, and get to finish up the causes. Yeah. And then we'll play another song from 1932. Let me just click one. Let me be clear on this. You're not writing a DBQ for this. Everyone got that? You're just doing the, the questions on this and writing your thesis on top. Everyone got that? You're not writing the full DBQ. Did everyone hear me say that? I'm just filling this out. I just It's just practice to go through the documents and think about it. It's good practice. And I know I squeezed it in there, but I thought I didn't want five pages. I, I just, uh, we get it in on one page. And I'm pretty proud of this. I know the font is small, but you are young and or what? Spry. Some of you are, you know, you're close. And you are young by the definition of young in this classroom. Younger than me. I think that's very logical. I could go into almost every classroom and say that. Well, Peter's, I mean, that's. Oh, this film looks pretty spry to me. All right, do we get the speculation? Yes. All right, so here we go. All right, so 1% and 90% of the stocks, and the thing about speculation is, that's another one accumulating well. Oh, what was the, the even though it wasn't the biggest, the biggest loss in history, what was the day that kind of represented the stock market crash? Black one, Black Tuesday. I know we have Black Thursday, Black Monday, Black Thursday. And, let's see, what else did we do yesterday? Yes, it was a big day. We did the stock market. Oh, what happened? Um, what did the GDP do by 1932? It dropped by how much? A third. And therefore, the money supply dropped by a third. What's GDP stand for again? Yeah, we got it. The GDP. What was on the wind up by 32? 25. But even then, it's probably significantly higher because they didn't count everybody. They still, they mean, that's just something that's really hard to figure out on unemployment. To this day, they can't really figure out figure out it's at unemployment. And so like in bad times, it's probably a little bit, it's probably low, the figure they get, and in good times, it's probably a little high. Because they just they don't figure it out. They just, if they try to come up with a formula, yeah, the Labor Department does the best. Yeah. So it, it's way it's got to be low in all those kinds of things. And, Oh, when did the depression, when did the recession begin? Oh, 29. I heard, I heard 49 too. Wow. We're, we're coming out of recession, the post war recession in 49. So we got overproduction. Or what was the big product they quit producing those and it rippled every part of the economy? Construction would also be a really big one. So we got speculation. We got 1%, 90% of the stock. Oh, what was, was the wealth trickling down? Yeah. So. I cut out a little bit here, but we have right now bubbles. What well, we have are two really big bubbles. It encouraged bubbles. And don't forget the thing about bubble economies. There is a euphoria when there's a bubble. And everyone thinks, I figured out the new magical way to make money. It happens every time. The big thing in 29 was a thing called investment trust. These they were called more there were these uh bonds that were created that people were investing in. And it was actually kind of crazy. People were investing in, so let's say you speculate in the stock market and you're worried, what happens if the price goes down? You know, what happens? Remember the margin call? So there was a form of insurance that you could buy in case your price of stock went down called an investment trust. So you put money in that and that would pay your margin. Well, there was no regulation. And so these investment trust companies didn't have any money to pay back the margin. And so people thought they had insurance and, and speculated even more. But it's better than that. Oh, it's so much better. Let's say I buy this from you. I send a piece of paper and you take my investment trust. He's a company. By the way, fly by night, he has no money. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> There's no regulations. 
Guess what he did with this? Everybody know? He sold this. He chopped it up into little pieces and sold them as bonds to other people. And so no one had any idea what these things were worth. And I should add, those other people, what did they do with the bonds he sold? He chopped them up and sold them again. I have a piece of paper saying my that insurance. So what could I do with that? Chop it up and sell it. And then chop it up and sell it. I could combine it with other debt, give it, make it another bond and sell it. Now, if all you're saying, how do you do that? I, I wouldn't even know what things were worth. Do you see the problem? Nobody had any idea what anything was worth. And everybody was speculating. And so that's where you get this crazy thing called derivatives in the 2000s. The same thing was happening. Gambling on the value of stuff that nobody knew if they existed or not. Nobody had any value. And so, when it burst, it exposed all the debt. It exposed all the debt. And, all, and the house of cards that was created by nobody knowing what assets were worth, nobody knowing what anything was worth. It was chaos. And the thing was, people were using these assets, these bonds, that nobody knew what they were worth and using them as collateral for debt. And so banks didn't know what they were getting back with their collateral. It was a madhouse. Three, the gap between the rich and the poor, <laughs> the wealth inequality. Now, the thing about wealth inequality, it's not natural. This was policies we talked before. And don't forget, that's the goal of trickle down economics increase money in the hands of the wealthy. And it worked quite well for that. But the problem was the money was not necessarily tricking down. I can't emphasize once again, the growth of monopolies made sure that wealth focused to the top and did not trickle down. That's what monopolies do. That's why companies want a monopoly. Now you might argue that's good and more efficient. You might think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it does focus well. And the other thing is finance. So finance in the generic term, Finance is the dealing, buying, selling of stocks and bonds, the debt that's involved with it, that is finance. So it's not, finance is not necessarily the idea of, you know, you're going to the store and buy products or taking a loan out for your, for, to buy a new car. It's Wall Street investment. It is buying and selling of bonds. It is buying and selling of stock. It is setting up corporations. That is the very generic term of finance. And here's the issue of finance. It exploded with speculation. Finance, this is speculation. Now, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but the vast majority of people who are involved in finance are what kind of people? They have to have wealth. And so you have people buying stock, you have rel relatively wealthy people buying stock, or very wealthy people buying stock, from other wealthy people. The money just circulating on the top. Does everyone catch that? That means what money's going to the bottom. Not very much in finance, because most people can't afford to speculate. So the money's spiraling on top. And there's less risk, at least appeared to be less risk than starting a business on their own. And so this has the effect of killing demand. So this is a pie chart from 1929, and 1% of the people had an income of $10,000 and over. Multiply that by about to one million you have it today. Approximately, you, know, it's, you can't go a complete comparison. That means the vast majority were making under 2,000, but it's even worse than this. <coughs> Half the population was both below the poverty line. Half the population in the United States made $750 a year or less than Do you want to guess what the median income of a farmer was? $273 a year. Now, once you multiply that by about 20, you get today's numbers. But that is almost nothing. How does this kill demand? People didn't have money to buy things. What kind of economy do we have after the 1920s? It's a consumer. People need to buy stuff. If money's... Now, we're having conversations back here. 
and that's going to end. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay, then ask me. Okay. <laughs> At least you're talking about the stuff. Yeah. It, yeah it, bare bargain. Okay. Yeah. But, but what it meant was is that the majority of people had less and less money to buy goods if money's going to the top. But the economy ne needs as many people as possible to buy stuff. If you don't have people buying stuff, the economy crashes. People, and therefore companies don't make money, and therefore either they close down or they lay off workers. I mean, why produce goods if no one's going to buy them? That's a really important element here. So, so a large gap between the rich and the poor is an economic ticking time bomb. It's an economic ticking time bomb. And it always is. It always is because it kills demand, especially when you have an economy that we developed with the Industrial Revolution. A capitalist economy needs to constantly grow. And if it can't grow, unemployment. This is a big deal. And so that means consumer demand tech is going to tank. Oh, sure, people will try to get away with it or get, get around it. If wages aren't going up or stagnant and you still want to buy stuff, how do you buy stuff if, you don't, if your wages are stagnant? Yeah, borrow money, but eventually you can't borrow anymore. Or you look around and you see, these people are losing their jobs. I better not borrow anymore. And thus, demand set. Yeah. Okay, who can they borrow money from? They can't borrow Sure they can. Okay. They can't, but it's, it's a little bit harder. It's harder. You know, the lower your income, is harder to borrow money. But yes, they can borrow. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Before the depression. Okay. Then once the depression hit, the bank's loan is no way. The banks are alive. So good question. Next. I like the cartoons, kind of the clever one. Dividing up the pie between the different classes. And I think you get the gist of it, right? That's different kind of cap now. That's a, Remember the paper, paper cap in the 19th century? That cap was a working man's cap in 1921. Just, just so you know. All right, so next, financial failure. There was a complete financial failure across the world. Now, fortunately, because of the New Deal, that did not happen in 2008. If it would have, oh, geez. But it did. The New Deal, the New Deal laws, those that were still in effect, saved the financial system. So, what's the thing about the financial system? There was basically no regulation of banks, no regulation of speculation at all. Banks were making risky loans, especially after the Florida real estate bubble collapsed. And, <clears throat> even over a reserve is, a reserve is for a bank. Hmm? Well, what do they do? Let's say you have a bank. You own a bank, and people put savings in a bank. And back then, that's how banks made most of their money. They had to encourage people to put savings in. So you put, you make, start a savings account. You give money to the bank, and by the way, then they give you a little piece of paper saying that they owe you this much money. So you're essentially, if you put a savings account in a bank, you're loaning money to the bank. That's what they're doing. You're loaning money to the bank. What do banks do with that money? Yeah, they mainly loan it out. They loan it out. They're hoping that everybody who has a savings account doesn't come at once and pull their savings out. So they need some money just in case. They need some money for when people do come. Not all, but when people, people come. What do they call that money? Reserve. And normally I consider to be a safe reserve for a bank would be 10% of deposits. 10%. But since there was no real set rule, especially with interstate commerce, some banks had less than 1% reserve. Some banks had negative reserves. Hmm? How do you get negative reserves? Yeah, they borrowed from other banks and also loaned out all the money they had. Now, one more thing about the fund of reserves. And this would never happen today. Let's say, who wants, I'm a bank. Who wants to borrow money from me? 20% down, 20% interest, compound interest, all right? Cool. You sign an IOU. You sign it, boom. I, I loan you a million dollars, you owe me a million dollars plus interest. That piece of paper, what is it to me? A million dollars. 
It's an asset. How much is it worth? A million dollars plus, plus interest, 20%. Oh yeah, it's over. I have a million dollars, even without interest. I have a million dollars, right? Does everyone see how that's an asset? You owe me, you owe me a million dollars. You signed a contract, so you're gonna pay, right? Uh, definitely. So what? Could that be a reserve? Do you see what I just did there? They were using what other people owe as a reserve. Could they do that today? What do you think happened in 2008? Now, what can I do with this? Couldn't I chop it up in pieces and sell it? Couldn't I take insurance on it? Chop it up in pieces and you chop that insurance up in pieces and I chop this up in pieces and we sell it? I'm not kidding about the chopping up in pieces. It's crazy what they do financially. It's absolutely crazy. So here's the point. Nobody knew what anything was for. Nobody knew if they're ever gonna get their money back. Nobody knew if banks were stable. All they make, oh, let's get back one more thing at risky loans. So let's say I'm banking and I want to loan a million dollars. We talked about this. I don't have a million dollars. So where do I get a million dollars from? Far from Bank B. Where does Bank B get the money from? Bank C. bank C. From Bank D. From Bank E, who ironically might have borrowed originally from me. All it takes is one bank to collapse, and what happens? The whole thing falls apart. Hmm? Yeah. In fact, I, you, you're jumping. Guess what I'm going to be typing here and type down in just a second? The whole thing built on debt, a house of cards. Yeah. Would that happen in 2008? Yes. Can that happen today? Yes. How would banks be like, what's the interest? Oh, okay. Interest and collateral. So the banks have to put up collateral. By the way, what would the banks put up as collateral? The debt, the, the, the assets they get because people owe them money. Yeah. And there's something else. And this is really important to understand. Virtually all banks are corporations. So remember, it's an entity. And so let's say I'm a loan officer working for a bank. Even the person who runs the bank by the CEO, I'm not the owner, they're stockholders. And so if I make a bunch of loans, I still get all my fees for making the loans and pay. And so if the bank still goes under, do I lose my fees? No. So why not make loans? Woohoo! I know, I would declare that too. You know a bank called Washington Mutual? Wow. That's what Washington Mutual, this big bank did, they bought up people's mortgages. And they just were raking in money, and then the whole thing just collapsed. Yet, this, yet the people, the highest ranking officers left with millions of dollars in the company collapsed. What year was that? 2009. I know that well because our more the mortgage my wife and I have for our home was bought up by Washington Mutual, and then we found out our mortgage was bought up by this place called SunTrust. So you might have heard of that. Yeah. So next, so what we have is interlocking debt. And we could go. I mean, there's so many things, and we talk about today. That's one thing. I don't know if I'm gonna do it this year. Special topics I've done the 2008 crash, and I might do a little brief one. But I literally last year had my class wanting to fight people. They were so mad at the financial system. It's so crazy. Either fight me or, or fight everybody or fight me because they don't understand it and they're mad at me. So, and the thing is, I only kind of understand it. Nobody really understands it. They're going to debt. And so here we have the debt ratio to the GDP. And look how much. Household debt and debt for, um, for private individuals was, is equivalent to the size of the entire economy. Because people were borrowing, 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 couldn't borrow anymore. New Deal controls kept the debt low. When the conservative revolution in the 1980s took place, remember that's deregulation. The next time it would reach 100% would be in 2008. Gee, I wonder what happened in 2008. Where are we at right now? We're floating about 60%. Is that bad? Not necessarily. 
But if it starts, if the debt to if the debt to GDP keeps going up, that could be bad. That's what that's what people should watch. But then again, if, if there's a bubble going, they get into euphoria and everyone forgets. So, what do you have? You have this crisis. Up uh, once once the things begin to panic or things fall apart, there's a bank panic. Bank panic leads to bank failures, and the banks that survive, they don't loan money to anybody. That's a credit freeze. Here are people lined up at a bank in New York City, demanding their deposits, and did this bank happen? Now, this is what would normally happen. They just locked the doors and ran away. You will see instances where the, the president of the bank will come out and he'll face the people. That takes guts. And we were in a credit freeze till about 2011. We like, it's almost impossible to borrow money. I mean, you could do it, but it, it was just, people were, everybody was scared because nobody knew if, what any asset was worth. Look at all the bank failures. I should add regulations that were put in place for what's called the savings and loan industry, which was kind of a local bank. They did mostly personal loans for mortgages. They got rid of those in kind of the Reagan revolution in 1980, and they all blew themselves up here. It took them about two years to blow themselves up. And then they got rid of some of the New Deal regulations, and that's the crash. You notice there's not as many banks here, partially because of the New Deal and partially because bank monopolies. There's just not as many banks. Yeah. So many banks are actually farms. Banks are right, farms. <laughs> think about it. Farms. Because the farm economy was already crashing, so small rural banks were already collapsing because farmers couldn't pay back their time. And the thing about it was, is that, of course, made everything more unstable because everybody's trying to make up the, for the losses they had. So, good question on that. Oh, and this, this is. Um, the drop in loaning from the depression. Look at the crash in loaning. That, that's pretty dramatic, isn't it? Nobody wants to buy anything. Nobody wants to loan money. No, and it's, how do you start a business? I mean, businesses can't start unless there's credit, period. I mean, they need credit. Even the most profitable businesses today, they, they borrow money every single day and then pay it back at night, called the paper market. They all do it. So you need credit. Huh? Oh, oh yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah. It took me a second of what? Oh, now I get what you're saying. All right, so debt deflation. Here's another biggie. Debt deflation is the one that is such a major crisis. Debt deflation. So what happens is this. If, if people make, you know, let's say, you know, We'll use a private individual, but obviously you're going to multiply this by corporations. Oh, I should add one more thing. Corporations owe money. Who's responsible for the debt? The corporation. The entity. Do the own, are the owners responsible for the debt? No. Because they're shareholders. The corporation is. And so that, think about in terms of, I'm going to talk about an individual, but for an entity, it makes it that much more complex. That's why bankruptcies today for businesses are so incredibly complex. So in a depressed economy, think about what's happening in a depressed economy. We can all imagine that, right? People are getting have less money. And even if your, your wages didn't go down, even if you're still doing well, you're looking around and saying, wow, all of these people are losing their job. I'm kind of worried about tomorrow. But let's say you didn't do well and you have debts today. You are a business or, or part of a business or a corporation. You overextended when times were good and you borrowed money and now you got to pay it back. Or an individual. I mean, think about it. 1928. The economy's booming. We're going to be rich forever. I'm going to buy those 20 goats. Isn't that the sign of wealth? You went out and buy those 20 goats. I'm buying all the goats I can get. And so you borrowed money to buy goats. Who would do that if they could do it, right? Borrow money to buy goats. Who likes goats? Have you ever been around goats? They're interesting. All right. So let's say you're not bringing in as much money as you can. What do you do? In a depressed economy and things aren't going well and you bought too many goats, 
there was a problem. You decide to pay back your debt, but no one's spending money anymore. Profits are down, wages are down, there's not as much money. That is what we call a liquidity trap. Has everyone got that? A liquidity trap. And a liquidity trap means that there's no liquid assets. Do you know what liquid assets are? Cash money. It means money that can be easily, it's fungible, you can spend with anything. If you have assets that are, let's say, fine art or baseball cards, it's really hard to cash those in. Who's going to take a baseball card? <laughs> so, with cash you can spend. But what if there's no money in circulation? Well, you got to come up with money, don't you? If you got to pay back their debts and you have less money, how do you do it? There's two ways to do this. Number one, you cut spending. Does that make sense? If you're in debt and have to pay it back, you don't buy it. Those extra 20 goats, even though you already got 20. Right? Or you don't buy that boat. You don't buy that car. You don't take that trip. Or for a company, you don't expand. Uh, expand. Maybe you don't buy that new innovation. Does that make sense to everybody? You cut spending. Now, wait a second. In a depressed economy, if all of a sudden you're cutting spending, what does that do to the demand of goods? If people quit spending, what happens to, to demand? And then what do you do? Demand starts going down. And then you sell off assets. So you sell off your goods. But what is everybody else doing with their goods? Oh, they're selling their goods too. What happens to the price of goods? They go down. Or whatever your asset might be, your stocks, your bonds, your real estate, your home, your art. Everybody starts selling everything. And what happens to the price of assets, of all assets? spiral down and here is the trap of debt deflation what if everybody tries to pay back their debt at the same time now if you have too much debt it seems like a very responsible thing to pay back your debt it is if you borrow too much money you better come back and pay it back especially the way our financial system works in the united states today <laughs> but what happens if twofold this is the money supply. And here's the money in circulation during the depression. You see a tank? So there's less money out there. And here's the price. Asset prices tanked. What happens if everybody pay back their debt at the same time? What happens to the economy? It's crash. What happens is very basic. Asset prices tumble. And it depresses the economy even. And so if it depresses the economy even more, and there's less money in circulation, and you still want to pay back your debts, what do you do? Well, you cut more spending, don't you? And you sell more assets, don't you? And what happens? The cycle begins again. The cycle starts again. How do you get out of this? How, this is actually, how do you get out of this? I mean, this is a crisis. All right, this is what we need then. What do we need? Somebody's got to start buying stuff. Here's the big thing. Put a little right here and write down a big letters. Demand. There's no demand. No one's buying anything. No one's buying anything. So everyone has to sell their stuff or pay back their debt because their debt is coming due. That means they cut more spending, which means less people buy stuff, which means asset prices drop again, which means they have to cut spending and so on. There is no demand. And let me clear, let's be clear. Would you buy anything at this time? And it gets worse than this. Let's say you want to buy a car. You don't need the car, but you, you still have a job and you want to buy a car. What are happening to prices when this is going on? Prices are dropping. You want to buy a car. Are you going to buy that car today? You're going to wait. Why? And then tomorrow. Huh. What, what, prices dropped a lot, but what, did, what are prices going to do tomorrow? And then the next day, what are you going to do? So what does deflation do to demand? Just by having deflation, it kills demand. So once again, demand drops. By the way, what does inflation do? If you think prices are going up tomorrow, what do you do today? Yeah. 
then a healthy economy needs a little bit of inflation. Hmm? You have to do something to get price. Get people want thinking they're going prices will go up, or give them some way to get them out. Yeah. So we're in this trap. And then government has see government's not the same as people. They make the money. They 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 pass the laws. They have an army. They're not the same as you or me or a corporation. Debt does not affect them the same way. Of course, debt affects them, but in a totally different way than it affects people. They're not the same. So what can government do? Well, government, of course, government people make mistakes. But wow, do they make a bunch of doozies. First of all, there was no evident regulation. Not, nothing in the stock market, nothing in the banks. And that would help fuel this over-speculation and overproduction. And there's no safety net. By having no safety net, this killed the man. I mean, the thing about unemployment insurance is this. If you're laid off for your job, which millions of people are going to be laid off in the Depression, just as they were in 2008 or just as they were in 2020, it's going to be people laid off. They go from having a paycheck to having nothing. Now, they might have savings, but how, how fast do you suppose people will go through their savings? Right? This is the way life is for most people. Unemployment insurance provides about a quarter to 30% of your previous paycheck until you find a new job. It's not that much. But it doesn't crash demand. So people don't go from spending, spending a certain amount to nothing. These are still spending a little bit. They call them automatic stabilizers. Same thing to do with unemployment, or I'm sorry, with Social Security. If we have a crash and you're near retirement, if you have a pension, I guess I can retire now, which opens up more job opportunities for younger people. So retirement pensions raise wages that way. Next, the Federal Reserve did the opposite of what they're supposed to do. To, to stop the speculation, they should have raised interest rates. That makes it more hard to borrow money. What did they do instead? They really didn't raise interest rates in 20 or 29. They did a little bit, but they should have dramatically raised interest rates in 28 when the spec of the boom was going nuts. And then all of a sudden when people quit spending money and banks aren't loaning money, that's when you cut interest rates. They actually hardly cut them at all, thinking that a cut in interest rates would hurt the already weakened bank industry, but it actually made it much worse. So, for example, in the 2008 financial crash, the Federal Reserve lowered the interest rates that banks charge each other. It's called the federal fund rate. It's basically the, the, the key interest rate. They cut it to zero, zero percent. So that meant every other interest rate, like mortgage or car, or credit card, dropped. Japan actually, during the crash, went negative interest rates. Yeah. Actually, for U.S. Treasury bonds, they went negative, too. Negative interest rates. But what did, they, what is the Federal, what did the Federal Reserve do in 2022 when they thought prices were going up too fast? They raised it to stop the spectrum. That's, what, that's why we have high interest rates, right? Relatively high for that reason. So they did not do what they're supposed to do. This is called monetary policy. What was the traditional way in the 19th century? If you want to protect your industry and keep out foreign competition, and therefore hopefully people buy more of your goods, and that would stimulate growth, what was the tax they would put on imports? They decided to dramatically raise the, the tariffs in 1930, in 1930, called the, Congress passed this law, the Holly Stoked Tariff. You've got to yell, Smoot! You can't just say Smoot. Yes, Smoot was a senator from Utah. No, you're a waiting person here from Utah. Yeah. They dramatically increased the tariffs. Now, the thought was this will protect American industries, but tariffs do what to all prices? So everyone got that? Prices went up dramatically. Prices went up. Now, wait a second. Prices are going up, and do people have money? No, it was a disaster. 
And then they're raising the tariffs on goods from Britain, Japan, France, Germany. So what did they do in response? They raised their tariffs. And it started an international trade war. My mouse disappeared. Someone hit my podium. It triggered a trade war. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, all these countries raised their tariffs and, and international trade plummeted. And so people who had surplus goods who wanted to trade them, couldn't trade them. The tariff was a disaster, an absolute disaster. Next, austerity. And this was another government policy. And austerity is, write down, cutting government spending. And the idea was this. When there's bad economic times, what happens to tax revenues? Tax revenues went down, and therefore the deficits went up. Deficit is the yearly difference between revenues and expenditure. We just talked about that by Germany yesterday. De re revenues and expenditures. Well, the deficits are, are going to go up in bad economic times. By the way, what do deficits or what happens to revenues in good times? Go up dramatically. If unless you cut taxes or something, but keep everything staying the same. Like what are revenues doing today for the federal government? They're going up like mad. Revenues are going up dramatically. Now, that doesn't mean you know they might you know, spend it all. Doesn't matter. I'm just talking about tax revenues. So there was a real cry. Wait a second. Our deficits going up. The accumulated deficits we call the debt. And people are saying, wait a second. How can the government continue to spend money when everybody else is broke? Here's a cartoon portraying this. Save, save is the American public. While Congress is spending money and running up a deficit. And so there was a cry to cut spending. And so government spending was cut in 1932. The term was they're going to balance the budget. Now, wait a second. Balance the budget? When no one's buying anything? And one more thing. President Hoover was economically and morally opposed to direct aid. So giving some kind of direct payments or direct jobs or benefits to people who were unemployed or retired. And so he opposed any effort, including an effort to give that bonus to veterans early. He was completely opposed. Why? Because he thought if you give money to the average person, what will they do? Yeah, they'll waste it. They'll quit working, they'll drink it away, they'll never look for a job because they don't know how to handle money. So what philosophy was it? After a social Darwinism. Most people, you got to coerce to work because they're lazy. So what happened? No one's buying anything. And the government cut spending. It killed demand. So that means the government's buying less stuff. And so demand drops more. You think private individuals are going to step into this? Not really, because no company is going to start production if no one's buying anything. Austerity. The worst year of the Depression, I'm sorry, the worst time will be the winter of 32 33 after austerity. The worst year of the Depression. Let me throw a country, a, an example out of a country that did severe austerity at the end of 31. 32 was a nightmare. It's a little place called I'm trying to remember the name, Germany. And who took power because of austerity and people got so mad? Hitler. No, we don't want Hitler. No, we don't want That would have been another one if somebody walked by and I'm going, Hitler. So it killed consumer dam and lengthened the depression. In your lifetime, uh, President Obama and conservative Democrats and most Republicans got really concerned about the deficit. And so they started austerity in 2010. And without a doubt, that lengthened that depression about two to three years. That's in your lifetime. You're at you're the heady age of four, right? 2010, were you four or three? Three or four? So were you paying attention to the, the federal budget then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and here is mocking uh, President, Ro uh, President Hoover's 
here's someone swim, uh, drowning because of the depression, and instead of helping him, he's throwing, throwing him a book that says how to swim. Yeah. In 32, there wasn't just food riots, there was starvation. Yeah. All right, tomorrow we finish up this last little bit and play, and we have to get out of the yard collected. Are there any questions on this on the spring break joy? And if you're staying here, it's going to be snowing all week, so yep. actually it's supposed to get warmer. I think it's supposed to be in the 50s for a high by Thursday and Friday here. I blame track and tennis and softball. Why? Anytime there's fall or spring activities, it starts snowing. As soon as you start getting closer to the meets in the game. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So now you can play the sport, right? Goodbye, okay, everybody. And if I won't see you tomorrow, have a good break. Try your best. Watch the videotape if you start missing me. Watch the tapes on YouTube. Yeah. Everything's on team, yeah. Everything's on team, but you also have to come. Yeah. See ya. Sometimes I wish we could have a pocket at the Sometimes I wish we could have a pocket at the Anytime there's an economic crisis, throw out the R out of it. And I'll put it back in your pocket. And it's not that FDR didn't make mistakes, but it was that whole thing of wanting to try something. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody grab one each. One each of those. One each of these things right here. Okay, well, I have no idea why it is. Maybe I accidentally hit the one, but I'll probably hit zero. So I can't specifically remember putting in your gray. I'm trying to show which R you have to scroll out of that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah, because the video has a bit of a. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. Back, look out. I must accidentally hit the wall with the zero. Wait, if you get to move on, it's, it's really good. Everybody grab one of each. Don't worry. One of them, it's, it's, it's not due until the end of the period. The big one. It's two major keys. If not, get it to that money. I'll take that a little more time for that. I have gifts for everybody. Oh, no. I know. I give too much. I'm too kind. You give too much. Jordan, you were dabbing the blood level. Yes, I don't know. You actually got to take it. Well, I have no idea. What do you think is the new nail? The next one. That one? Yeah, please. You did the usual. We were being so
So I have nothing for you to do today. I was going to do, I was going to grade some stuff, but we had a big issues with the vigilante. How is everybody? All right, so let me explain this to everybody very quickly. Is that the bell? All right, let's go. Here we go. Two things really quick. This, this, and this. All right, so we have, we have three things to get. Oh, drop it. First thing, and this is the review packet for the AP exam. And it is not due till May 13th. Because what are you guys doing, on, most of you are doing on May 10th? That's the exam. Now, you're not going to do this whole thing. These are notes to review, and you down a few things, but this is for your review. I do give you credit for reviewing, but the big thing is for you. But the first uh, seven pages, yeah, you're going to have to do it. For sure, all of them. And then after that, I pick and choose what you need. So you will not be doing the whole thing. And this will be a review session, but I'm giving it to you now. A lot of time to start going through it. None of this is due at the end of spring break. But in case you have some free time, just get a little bit done here and there. If you peck away at it, you get a lot of it done, and it really does help review. And then I would do review sessions. And there's something about review sessions. Those who did the review sessions last year for the AP exam did significantly better and felt better about doing it. And I understand there are, there's going to be conflicts, but it really did make a difference. And now, um, not for everyone, of course, but yeah, they really have next. You're not doing a full DBQ, but you're doing the documents for a DBQ, or you're doing this, reading it. I want to get it on two sheets, so I've made the print small, but you are young, and I would argue, and or spark. I make an argument. I can't prove it. So, up here, so that I want to pack it in on one sheet, jot down the basic element of your thesis, and what you're going to prove, your, your actual why, the A, B, and C, and then for each document, Answer these questions in a phrase. Since it's a phrase, it can be in pen or pencil. Your choice. Only sentences. But answer these things. You have historical context or related to something that's going on. Does it prove your thesis? And then the half, what you would compare to for each document. So you have to do this after you kind of go through the new deal and all that. Sound good? So you're not writing a DBQ, thesis, and just doing these. All right? That's due on Monday when you get back. Yeah, that's spring break. This May 13th, right? I'm just giving it to you now so we can get it to you. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish that in just one second. Next, 516 and 518 in the review book, there are eight multiple choice questions. Do the multiple choice questions and do those after you've gone through kind of the reading and stuff with the New Deal. And then the key is on teams. So after you get done, go back and grade yourself. I'll give you a few points for doing it, and I post this on Teams. I know you want to capture this moment forever for your scrapbook, but it's also on Teams. And am I in it? Oh yeah, you're smiling. Why did you steal my shadow? <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, so I did assign. There's two readings that I assigned, but I didn't make a big deal about this week. 1,088 to 1,011 and 01 for on the Great Depression and chapter 25. That's the new deal. I originally was going to give you the full bookmark, but I decided to give you a smaller one. So you see this right here? These are the what you need to know from the reading. You have to know this. 
And so when you get back on Monday, I'll answer questions on it, go over it. My plan is then to have a test, and this will be on the test for Tuesday. Sound good? And that's so stuff on class, probably Tuesday. I might do it on Wednesday, but Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be, I, I think I might do short answer questions, but it'll be like short IDs, a few matching, a few multiple questions. But that's the only thing. One with asterisks would be the topics for some kind of test. Are you happy? I actually cut it back a little bit when my original plan was. Yeah. Hmm? So, the extra credit. There is extra credit on Tunes. There are two documentaries I want to have time to show on the Great Depression, ones I really like. So I decided to give it to you. I, the same thing I like about those other two doc, last two documentaries you watch. Good personal interviews, <clears throat> very well done. And if you get those done, you can choose. Except third or fourth fourth. No, here's the deal on this. If you want to do the extra credit, One to the extra credit. Pick up, these are the two worksheets for. Fill out the two worksheets. You do one or both. And I will give you a little bit more credit if you do both. Okay. Just for this one. Any questions? Yeah, you said I can do four thirds. Yeah, but not four thirds. I will I will decide. I will leave you decide, but you have to let me know or I'll put it on for you. Or actually, I'll see how much time I have to grade. Unless you make it very clear, then I just got to put them in when I can. All right, so there's got to be a little spring break, but remember, I will make it up to you. After the exam, after you take your final two weeks after the exam, nothing but fitness, trench digging, wall sets. Hmm? What's that? Well, mo, well, we'll do, you got to dig the trenches first to protect the moat diggers. Yes. And what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. America. Actually, chapter 20. The you can also use the review book for some of the Great Depression. I believe that's chapter 24. Chapter 25 of America. Yeah. All right, let's go take your notes out. So, the test over this won't be until probably Tuesday or Wednesday. That's my plan. And all of this is on Teams. There are copies of everything on Teams. There's copies of everything on Teams. And the videos are on Teams. I checked during my study all, and they do work. Yeah, I really like them. I, I think those are great videos. You have the Great Depression. And so, let's get out of this really quick. And scroll back. We finished. We just on speculation. So we got overproduction? Yeah. All right, really fast. What was, okay, I gave you three black days. What was the last one that everyone kind of signifies the crash? Yeah, that's Black Tuesday. And, did you have a question? You sure? I couldn't help you out your hand up or not. It went up and then went down when you came up. All right, next. Next. You were here yesterday, right? What's the GDP again? What's the sample? And how much did it go down in the first years of the depression? By 1932, how much? By a third. What was unemployment by 1932? And 25% the thing about that one was, it was probably higher. Whenever it's a depression, the unemployment rate is probably higher than what is. And actually, good times, the unemployment rate is probably a little bit, the actual unemployment rate is actually a little bit lower than the number. Just because there are fewer people looking for jobs. Even though they come, they have a formula to figure it out, but it's it's not ever 100% correct. And what happened to the money supply the first three years? Yeah, people just didn't, weren't spending money, even if they had it. So what was the product 
as an overproduction, but what was the one that symbolized the, the depression? Because once everybody quit buying that product, it spread to every part of the economy. Cars. Cars. Because yeah. it went to everywhere then. Oh. Hey, what does motel stand for? Motor. Yeah, motor hotel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I, I must have been, I think my dad told me that when I was like six or something. And I remember just like, like somebody just told me the secret code of life. I figured out what motel meant compared to hotel. I thought that was so cool. <laughs> and it's funny how I still vividly remember that feeling of learning what motel meant when I was like six. Are, do, you have the, do you have the same feeling with motel? Yeah, everyone kind of feels that way about the definition of motel. So let's get to over speculation. Speculation. So the tax cuts were not going to production, at least as much as they thought. The plan was tax cuts would do what to work? Do we have this yesterday? What did we finish in yesterday? We just got tax cuts. Yeah, tax cuts not going to production. I made a quick change on that. Top, the top 1% actually had 90% of the stock. 90% of the stock, they were investing in the stock market. And the buying and selling of stocks and bonds and the and the borrowing of money for that, it's called finance. That's fine. And, yeah. There were some people saying, if you keep buying stock, things will get better again. Yeah, that's what that was. You keep buying it, it's going to have to go up. Remember, there's a euphoria that happens during a bubble. And that's going to create two big bubbles, the real estate bubble and the stock market bubble. I mean, all, every financial crash has a bubble. And so this is a you know, stock market bubble. The prices are much higher than everyone thought, and they realize they're, they're spending too much. Like, for example, when everyone realized they were buying swamp in Florida, it's like someone popped the bubble and prices just tank. And the big thing about, about, a, big thing about a bubble, when the prices go, it's not a slow, gradual drop. It's a crash. And that's the thing. If everybody's buying on margin or borrowing money, they can't pay it back. And it exposed all the debt. Bubbles crashing exposed all of the debt and all of the risky loans that banks were making at once. You know, there's, hey, there's going to be issues. And people make bad investments. Banks make bad investments in, with their credit, too. But if they all happen at once, it exposes all of the problems and it overwhelms the financial system. And so here I like this nationwide fever over stock speculation. They knew it was going on, but nobody was either willing or understood what to do. And that leads to another big thing, the gap between the rich and the poor. Wealth inequality. What's the name of the economic system of the 1920s? And that was the goal of trickle down. Today we would say supply side. And that was about put money in people's hands. And that's where you get, this is an income pie. And it's actually not a very good chart, but it has 65% of the population made less than $2,000 a year. Now, multiply that by about 20 and it's in today's dollars. And you can't do an apples and oranges comparison just because we have different expectations of money now. But still, that's pretty low. But add one thing about the goal of trickle down economics. The median, I'm sorry, the poverty rate was $750 a year, and half the population was below the poverty. $750 a year, and half the population. You want to guess what the median, the middle income for farmers was? So the poverty wage, $750. The median income for farmers, $273 a year. So we have a lot of people just barely getting by, but where's the wealth going? The idea was to trickle down, but it's not trickling down. And so you have, oh, and then don't forget, all these monopolies are focusing money and finance. Finance are buying and selling and stock. And for the most part, especially with 90% of the pop, or 90% of the stock owned by 1% of the population, if I'm rich and buying a stock, fuck, the odds are, are you rich or poor? <coughs> if you have stock. You have rich, so I'm, we're just passing money back and forth. If you're rich. Is money trickling down? 
It can a little bit. You know, I could take you could take your profit and build a factory and hire workers, or you could buy more stock than somebody else. And that's what was happening. Finance, the money spirals around on I mean that's is it like that today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Most people do not have stock today. It's, it's about 70% don't own stock today. I own a little bit. Um, you know, I have a retire. I, my wife and I have a retirement accounts, and we have our retirement now. And I should add one more thing about stocks. I said most people don't, don't own stock. So I, I'm a teacher. I'm on a retirement system as a public employee. I, when I retire, I will get.